All right, cool. So, Marcuse, once again, this time an essay on liberation. So, I'll uh, just jump right into it. This is a short thing. It's an essay, but it's I have it in book form because it's like 90 pages. But, yeah, so here we go. So, he starts out by saying that traditionally sociologists, other kind of critical theorists, uh, were dissuaded from imagining utopia. And the reason for that is because utopia has gotten a pretty bad rap, right? How can you sketch it? You know, under whose guidance will it be orchestrated? Will it be run? And it raises a lot of muddy kind of questions about who will essentially fit the bill. Who is going to take on, um, I guess, the process by which it can come into fruition and who will maintain it? Marcuse even adds that those people that would speculate utopia or one of the reasons that people wouldn't speculate it is because people were afraid of losing their scientific character or kind of losing any kind of scientific validity behind their work. So while Marcuse is sympathetic in saying that, you know, at one time, or for the majority of what we know to be history today, uh, such a possibility, that is the possibility of utopia, was unthinkable for these very reasons. He, on the other hand, wants to suggest that today, there might actually be room for it. There might be room for a thing called utopia what he will come to call a kind of new sensibility later on in the text. And he says that this is uh, a necessity. He says that we are driving to a point in under late capitalism that is going to inevitably lead to a kind of destruction. And we must, in order to curb that, start to think about utopia in ways that are possible, that are pragmatic. So he says that it is only with this system, precisely by its, you know, accumulation of wealth and accumulation of surplus and supply and all that, that we can begin to imagine a utopia because we essentially have the means to do it. So this is keeping up with the Marxist uh, or with Marx and Engels thesis, one of their theses, that in order to arrive uh, at communism for them or arrive to communism, we need to essentially go through capitalism because there are certain criteria that need to be met before kind of communist system can arrive. One of those is uh, a development of scientific knowledge. There needs to be literacy among the entire population. There needs to be a relative surplus increased. There needs to be an alienated working class who develop who have developed a kind of literate knowledge can then say we can't live like this any longer and then it will necessitate or sort of catalyze the movement into communism. So Marcuse is essentially saying the same things. And over the course of this text, he does make little, um, uh, he, he adds various qualifications that distances him from Marx and Engels. But for the most part, there are some pretty strong similarities. So one of the pieces of evidence that he cites in order to make this claim is that advanced capitalism and socialism that we found back when he was writing this in the 60s uh, essentially had the means to end poverty all across the globe. So he says, it seems as though we have, of course, we have the means to do this. What we need then is a paradigmatic shift, a shift in the way that people understand themselves, people understand the world, so that we can move this system, we can kind of direct it towards a utopian alternative, where we can get rid of things like poverty, alienation, repression, in favor of an emancipatory or liberatory alternative. So what this fundamentally comes down to then for Marcuse, and this is for me one of its more interesting claims, is an assault on or uh, a kind of for us to militate against what has come to be constituted as human biology. And I don't mean that in the abstract sense of biology as it floats above and determines everything. But rather, Marcuse is trying to illuminate the fact that the way we understand ourselves has come to be wholly true. And that is through, you know, the various modes of domination that we have come to internalize through, you know, late capitalism, through other forms of like fascist control that essentially has seeped itself, has kind of burrowed itself into our bodies and has altered our biology. So this is really the stake for him, or he really uses this example to highlight the importance of this need 
to emancipate our bodies, but also to highlight the, the extent to which the system has affected us. So that propels us here into the first chapter, the first section, uh, titled A Biological Foundation for Socialism. So really speaking to that, you know, the biological implications of the social system in which people are found, you know, how it changes our biology. So he starts this chapter out by saying that capitalism is essentially uh, the escalation of commodity production and productive exploitation. So that's, you know, right out of Marx and Engels. It's actually right out of everything. Uh, the production of commodities is pretty well restricted to capitalism. So what Marcuse says might have been at one time its kind of logical uh, parameters and well, yeah, <laughs> if we can say that. But it's logical parameters. That is, you know, the direct association between, you know, use value and the amount of labor that goes into something or the value of something having a direct correlation to the the means by which that thing is made. So the Marx example is like if you have a shoe and the labor and supplies and materials and all that costs a dollar then you should be sell the shoe for a dollar like that is what the shoe is worth so what happens in capitalism is uh, with a thing called fetishism is that the object that is created that is the commodity can actually develop a value that extends beyond the means by which it is made so let's say that shoe is then worn by LeBron James that shoe can then be sold for not a dollar, but $60 or $70. You know, this is kind of a, my numbers are way off, but it's just to kind of demonstrate what occurs under late capitalism. That is with fetishism, an object or a commodity being in, um, bestowed a value that extends beyond the means by which it is made. So what this essentially ushers in for Marcuse is a heightened sense or an escalation of waste, destruction, and management, essentially to keep the system going. So in this respect, he tells us that the system is fundamentally obscene. It is obscene in that it is, um, it is obscene in producing and indecently exposing a stifling abundance of wares without any kind of, um, any discretion. It just produces and produces and produces not to satisfy needs, but of course to create them. But the way in which we see or imagine obscenity is really limited to the aggressive, dominating tendencies of the system. So he gives us an example. He says, Obscene is not the picture of a naked woman who exposes her pubic hair, but that of a fully clad general who exposes his medals. So with this image, or with this comparison, we can get the sense of how Marcuse imagines a kind of liberatory stream that is things pertaining to sexuality, to, uh, you know, bodily emancipation and all that. And what he um, aligns on the opposite side, that is domination, control, hierarchy, and aggression. But we must be careful, however, because even Marcuse is, um, I guess, suspicious of sexuality as being a kind of, in and of itself, an emancipatory project or an emancipatory act. Because he says that it is really, it's utilized by the system itself in many instances to try and promote that system. You know, the slogan, sex sells. Well, that very much relates to a form of domination that masquerades, that kind of veils itself under the pretense of a kind of liberation, of a kind of, um, you know, emancipation. So we find a contradiction in the system here, at least according to Marcuse, and that contradiction goes as follows. This system that is obscene should feel shame. However, it does not. So it feels no reserve or no discretion when it comes to what it can put on display and what it can profit from. So it profits from dropping bombs on kids overseas. It profits from, you know, uh, exploiting women all across the globe. It profits from, um, you know, the oppression of various minority groups, both on, you know, the home front and overseas. 
And because of that, it doesn't, because it doesn't feel shame, even though it should, sees absolutely no barriers to its oppressive tactics, to its oppressive tendencies. So all those zones that might have one point been um, places of resistance to these dominating tendencies have been taken up by the system to evacuate them of their potential. So sexuality, where for Marcuse at one point could have been could have housed a kind of liberatory potential, is then commodified. It's packaged and sold so that it is, I guess, denied any kind of radical alternative. And that ultimately, these um, these kind of zones that were once liberatory are, you know, refuse that possibility because they are managed by what he calls the father-like figures or the father-like leaders, sorry. So this relates to one of his other books that I've yet to do on here, and I'm not going to make a whole lot of reference to it because I haven't read it in a few years and I'm not totally confident or comfortable with it. But Eros and Civilization, in which he makes the case that uh, the kind of oppressive tendencies that we find in late capitalism have a very strong correlation with the various tendencies the Oedipal paradigm reveals to us. That is, we exist in a mode of domination, domination from a father-like capitalist system of domination that, for Marcuse, he thinks he can kind of uh, diagnose by using the Oedipal paradigm. So, you know, that all that's all I'll say about that. So in response to this system, in the form of what he calls the great refusal, the refusal. There must be an awareness of the way that our biology, that is our um, a kind of proclivity or propensity for various things, you know, the things that we think are, you know, natural human wants, are really, you know, not quote unquote natural, but are in fact part of the very system of, you know, domination like control over our bodies, you know, what parts of our bodies are allowed to have hair and what parts aren't, you know, we feed that into a broader paradigm of sexuality, which we then associate with naturality. So we follow a kind of logical sequence that goes as follows. I need to fuck. In order to get fucked, I have to look like this. In order to look like this, I need to do X, Y, and Z things to keep me fuckable. So this process naturalizes many of the various steps in that process, which essentially makes us, you know, ripe for domination because we so easily internalize the master's logic or the logic of domination. So any revolt, any refusal must be aware of this because it, what it comes down to for Marcuse is recognizing what parts of ourselves or what wants or desires or needs we have are fabricated by a system of domination and those that aren't, which is a a tough task because, you know, as versed as we might all be in a kind of post-structuralist understanding of the world, any kind of association with a real or with real needs is instantly troubled. So we need to really, you know, be careful in this process, but I think it's still a project worth conducting or it's something to always keep on the horizon which is something he addresses because he doesn't want to sketch out this perfect system or to sketch out, you know, what we need to do. Rather, he is just interested in the possibility of resistance and how it will take on a multifaceted character in order to accomplish its goal. So this marks a fundamental distinction, at least for Marcuse, between what he's doing and what he believed Marx and Engels to be advocating for, where for him at one time, It seemed as though only having an alienated working class was necessary in order to promote a revolutionary spirit or to kind of usher in, uh, you know, the communist dream. For him, or for Marcuse, I should say, it is instead, or in addition to that, he adds that we must have an imagination. Kind of like um, it would be, we would run amiss if we weren't guided by a kind of um, possibility that is allotted by imagination, that is creativity, you know, knowledge, intelligence, all these types of things that the imagination essentially allows. Uh, without that, the, the revolutionary spirit would essentially replicate the exact same system that it is trying to escape from. And that is because for Marcuse, 
laborers or blue-collar workers of the proletarian are not in and of themselves radicals. Like, look at what's going on or what has been going on in the United States for a very long time. I mean, laborers are the people that vote for conservatives. They vote for the reactionaries that are essentially opposed to, you know, any kind of revolutionary spirit. So what this shows or reveals for uh, Marcuse is the extent to which having that class is not enough. It must be tied to a kind of revolutionary imagination. So now we have a kind of dialectical play between an imaginary spirit and a kind of laboring, you know, body or individual. Now what a kind of harmonious dynamic between the two will allow is for what Marcuse calls a new type of man, human, really, um, which he associates back with an idea that came out of Marx and Engels of what they call the all-round individual. So this possibility is really closely associated with um, an, a change in how we imagine science or the possibilities associated with it. Because thus far, science has been a fairly oppressive tool in that it has been used to justify various terrible things. For Marcuse, he sees, like Marx and Engels, he sees a potential behind science to kind of elicit, to motivate a rational use, a rational outlook of the society in which we find ourselves. So the ultimate goal for Marcuse is to make the system rational. Now, what better way to do that than to use the quote-unquote rational system par excellence is to essentially, you know, use it in favor of this project and to take it away to kind of wrest it from the hands of dominating, you know, oligarchs and demagogues. Now, what this new human would be like is difficult to sketch, and Marcuse is clear about that. But he says that one of the fundamental things that this new human will, one of their fundamental attributes, will be that they are no longer ashamed of themselves, which is an interesting point. It's something that he uses Nietzsche to kind of argue, at least briefly. He just uses like one quote, actually. But Nietzsche speaks, writes about this quite a lot. That is the idea that, you know, modern human have internalized a sense of ressentiment, which is like resentment essentially for oneself or against oneself. Because in a world that tells everyone, you know, you're never good enough or in, you know, late capitalism, you can never have enough or you'll never be satisfied or anything like that. Of course, people will always feel a sense of like anxiety and fear that is just overbearing. So this new type of human will for Marcuse trouble all that. Now, the implications for this extend a little bit further, and he uses this to argue against one of the another Marxist tenant. That is, for him, he does not like the idea of work. Because for him, work is something that people do when they hate themselves, when they have to get up at 6 a.m. to sit in three hours of traffic to go somewhere to work for $10 an hour for eight hours and then drive home in two hours of traffic. Like, only people that hate themselves do that. So for him, a socialist or communist kind of possibility cannot really be predicated on work what he calls en masse, that is like um, in like large numbers, because he wants to see a blurring of the line between work and play, which might seem like a bit of a fantastical idea. But for him, it ultimately comes down to disturbing the idea that work must be done and that work, when it is conducted, must be, you know, alienating must be done in a way that is, you know, for just everything that has to, not to do with you, that is for profit or that is for, you know, and anything else, in order to usher in the possibility of work as play, essentially. So then that propels us here into the second chapter, the new sensibility, which is essentially his term for this communist possibility. So... Primarily, it is a political thing. This doesn't exist in some kind of abstract conceptual dimension. This actually has, you know, a place in the world for him. And it is imminent, that is, it is 
inside of what he calls the proper use of science and progress, which, when used properly, can bring about the end of injustice. Because, you know, the system that we live in is has become very unjust. It sees no problem dropping bombs overseas or shooting its own civilians or anything like that, yet is, you know, you're not allowed to swear on Parliament Hill or in the case of Canada or in Congress or anything like our priorities are so fucked up that like we we don't even have a, like a real conception with a thing called justice not to say it you know exists as something tangible that can be grabbed but it's not even talked about so anyways i kind of digress uh this new sensibility for marcuse would essentially blur the lines not only between work and play as i just mentioned but also between art and work. So he wants to usher in what he calls a kind of aesthetic ethos. That is a world in which that is artful, a world that is beautiful. So what this would mean is the system of aggression would be supplanted, that is replaced by a system of joy, a system of beauty, a system of art. So what is it, he asks, about art that is fundamentally emancipatory or freeing? Because that's a hard claim. To claim that art is something that just magically frees people is, you know, you, you have to substantiate that with some kind of argumentation. And different thinkers over the course of time have their different st stances on it, from Nietzsche to Marcuse here. So he'll, he tries to, or he will now, try to unpack what he thinks about that or how art can possibly be like that. So historically, he says philosophers have been interested in the concept of beauty or the beautiful and one of the ones that he uses the most is Kant uh, who I was debating as to whether or not to do a whole thing here just talking now about what Marcuse thinks about Kant because he goes off of, on a fairly big tangent to talk about Kant's idea of the sensible or ideas of the sensible and of reason and how they associate with a transcendental uh, kind of principle to which I dissuaded myself from doing that because it's a pretty big tangent and it takes a long time to explain. And I plan to do a whole thing about Kant on this channel soon. So I'll, you know, save it for that. But again, I digress. Okay, so many uh, scholars, many philosophers have been interested in this idea of beauty or the beautiful. And for him then, or for Marcuse, that then attests to its kind of existence in the world. So he says that because it is something that is of the extreme interest to everyone, that is, people like things that are beautiful, people like things that are excellent and all that, it must have some kind of association with what he calls the life instinct, which is, in his other book, kind of um, placed under the umbrella term eros as opposed to thanatos, which is the death instinct. So because of that, he makes the case or makes the kind of logical leap that therefore it is something that we must foster in this system, precisely because it speaks to a kind of natural human tendency. So he gives us some examples on 28 in my version. From the harmless drive for better zoning regulations and a modicum of protection from noise and dirt to the pressure for closing of whole city areas of automobiles, prohibition of transistor radios in all public places, decommercialization of nature, total urban reconstruction, control of the birth rate, such action would become increasingly subversive of the institutions of capitalism and their morality. And that these correspond to what he calls the aesthetic morality which is the opposite for him of Puritanism. So these might seem like kind of banal examples, but he uses them to highlight that there are tendencies within people to appreciate various, you know, peaceful uh, kind of modes of existence, like not being surrounded or covered in filth, not wanting loud, disturbing noise, but wanting peaceful, you know, nice things. So what I will say about his use of Kant is that he believes like in Kant, so quickly, very quickly, in Kant there are two broad faculties. There's the faculty of reason, 
So that's the faculty by which someone can uh, essentially arrive at a conclusion without necessarily experiencing the thing. So one example that Kant gives is um, the, uh, the example that all bachelors are single, which is true, but I haven't met all bachelors. So I haven't experienced this phenomenon. I've only logically arrived at that conclusion. Now, he doesn't exactly oppose that, but on the other side, he provides the example of sensibility. That is, what you experience in the world tells you something about it. So if you were to say, this bachelor is sitting on the table, that's a very specific thing that doesn't tell you about all, uh, about all bachelors, as the case all bachelors are single does only tells us the case about a single bachelor and only about a single instance in the world. But it does give us something of a connection to the world. Now Kant says that these two faculties are essentially underwritten by what he calls a kind of transcendental principles that are unchanging, that are inalienable. So what they come down to essentially for him are space and time as two things that everyone perceives without necessarily having experienced it, because we cannot understand it prior to being, but at the same time, it's something we can't understand until we think it. So it occupies a kind of a place in between sensibility and in between cognition or in between reason, but underwrites their possibilities, because you can't imagine anything existing in space without knowing what space is. So space precedes us, yet it is what constitutes virtually everything we exist in. So like Kant, Marcuse is suggesting that there is something that underwrites our faculties for reason and sensibility, but those things aren't necessarily some transcendent, universal, you know, quality. It is instead, you know, the systems we find ourselves in. So the system determines what we consider or how we even look at the world determines how we look at ourselves, it determines, you know, how we will essentially exist. So it is in that way that he, you know, applauds Kant, but applies his own spin to it. So yeah, I think that that was fairly clear. But anyways, so what Marcuse wants is a kind of aesthetic sensibility. So an aesthetic care for reason, an aesthetic care for sensibility, in a way that moves us away from the determining factor of domination. So what this would mean then is the end of the commercialization of art, and it would essentially bring uh, art, or the aesthetic, and reality together. So the old distinction between, or the distinction we find ourselves in, that is a system of reality, which Marcuse troubles because he says that it's not like universal, it's a reality directly affected by late capitalism, uh, that constantly or continually creates a distinction between itself and the thing that exists outside, that is art, he says that this new sensibility will bring art and reality together. That is, we will find ourselves in this aesthetic ethos, a kind of aesthetic sensibility or this aesthetic reality. And because this is so outside of our you know, understanding today, of the system we find ourselves in, he says that it's very unreal to some extent. It's kind of a surreal possibility just because it's, you know, way out there. But it doesn't mean it's not possible, nor does it mean that it's not even imaginable. But that to imagine it, we have to get a little wacky. So insofar as our selves, our understanding of ourselves through our ego is determined by the system we find ourselves in, to oppose that system is then to oppose the ego, is then to oppose ourselves, to kind of usher in what Nietzsche calls, I think, or I think I can make the smooth association here, a kind of primal unity. That is to hearken back to uh, what Marcuse believes fundamental to human beings, that is community and joy and beauty and love and dancing and all that play and stuff and all that, that will essentially foster a better system. But in this process, art, that that which is kind of mobilized in favor of this move, will turn negative because it opposes the system in which it is embedded. So it becomes a kind of negative art, a kind of negative sequence in order to arrive at this positive conclusion. 
So going from here, that is imagining art as a negative art, Marcuse goes so far as to suggest that art itself will even disappear because it will cease to belong to the domain of art, that is, the domain outside of reality, because it will become totally immersed with reality. It, they will exist in harmony in such a way as to disturb their steady demarcation, therefore disturbing art as art, as we, as we have come to know it. So then that pushes us here into the third chapter, that is subverting forces in transition. Okay, so... He begins this one by saying something that we all already know. Capitalism creates needs. It doesn't really satisfy them. So we are no longer in the throes of a kind of demagoguery. It is an entire systemic change that we need. So it's not like there's a king that we have to overthrow. It is instead an entire overhaul of the very system and the way it dictates who we are, what we need, why we need it, and all that that has to be overhauled. So as I kind of alluded to earlier, this does come down to the individual to some extent. So the individual must interrogate the parts of themselves they think are determined by them in advance and things that they themselves actually need for themselves. So what this will bring up are, is an emphasis on what he calls subjective factors. So there are very uh, specific needs that specific people need essentially and it is up to them to reveal that so what we will see then is a kind of what he calls spontaneous solidarity among different people with different needs belonging to different groups that cannot be totally uh, encapsulated under the old umbrella of the proletarian because that's too it's too broad it doesn't capture like intersectionality is just one excellent um, kind of supplement to this so it must or we must be prepared to recognize that the revolutionary imagination or the imag uh, revolutionary force won't correspond to a single narrative. It will instead be, to some extent, rhizomatic. It'll be indeterminate. But it is precisely through that indeterminacy that Marcuse sees a potential. So what sequesters this? What buttresses this possibility? Well, a number of different things. And one of the ones that he focuses on is the development of kind of expertise among the blue collar factions, where there are jobs that are needed, like, you know, middle management and upper middle management and all that type of thing, and other different kinds of expertise that uh, correspond or that are uh, made to watch over, you know, technical equipment or computers or whatever that demands, you know, a lot of schooling. And for the most part, these people are pretty well compensated. So this throws a wrench in any possible revolutionary paradigm because suddenly what was once considered the working class is now divided amongst people that are doing relatively well and that probably enjoy what they do considering, you know, they are trained experts in a field that they spent years studying and going through those processes that in the first place probably came about because they were already born into wealth not not the case that's not always the case but for a good chunk of it especially at the price of universities today um, so it's in that capacity that there is a kind of counter-revolutionary spirit even embedded within the blue-collar worker paradigm within uh, within the proletarian force so this is on top of even those quote-unquote true proletarians that you know, vote conservative or that don't like, you know, any kind of help or any kind of like possible talk of revolution or even like r reform, like to be as liberal as, as that can be. So to catalyze the revolution, then the very foundations of capitalism have to be weakened. And this happens in a number of different locations all over the world. Where Marcuse says that the third world and many of the kind of revolutionary uh, revolutionary endeavors occurring there are doing this. They are taking apart capitalism at its roots. So some of the examples is um, what he calls the ghetto population. That is the impoverishment of mostly black people in urban settings that he says are constantly 
fighting against the system because the system is constantly fighting against them. And what is more, they fight against or militate against, you know, white oppression. Oppression by white people, not white oppression. Oppression by white people who are essentially complicit and who in some respect take on the kind of face, take on the kind of image of, you know, the owners of the means of production because they own all the property and then uh, oppress through that process um, marginalized people of color in all over the place. So white people are very much complicit in that process. So Marcuse is like, yeah, you know, we have to keep that in mind. But at the same time, there is a kind of uh, similarity between the two forms of oppression. That is, they both are symptoms of a kind of capitalist form of exploitation. So we could take that at a grain of, you know, with a grain of salt, because racism, to some extent, it depends what kind of uh, analytic lens you want to look at it through, uh, v- precedes capitalism in very many ways. So by just ushering them in this kind of new sensibility that is taking on capitalism will not necessarily bring about, you know, the end of racism. So I think that we must keep, if we're going to take Marcuse seriously, we have to keep these other, you know, political struggles in the back of our minds also, or the front of our minds, you know, make them top priority in order to usher in, you know, an actually benevolent system. So then from here, and this is kind of a jump, so sorry, he talks about uh, student movements or student protests that he says meets a lot of resistance by organized labor, which is certainly the case everywhere. Like workers hate you know, students that protest, you know, they say, like, what do they have to complain about? Like, the, you know, they're at school. And that's, you know, I think we'd all know that is simply the masters turning the people suffering against one another, right? So the student protests are very much in the same, uh, in the same situation as the laborers. And they really want the same things. But I think that, and this is what Marcuse is getting at, uh, the student protesters can't lose sight of that fact, and they can't make it a, solely about them. So while it's totally important that we have to revolutionize the way that university is conducted, that has, this has to be in favor of a broader project. That has to be in favor of including those people that are have constantly or have historically been the most, not the most, but greatly oppressed under capitalist exploitation or through it. So what are some of the qualities then of this revolutionary spirit? Well, it will appear unlawful because the law, that thing that is determined by the system, you know, sets out who its enemies are. And its enemies are those people that oppose it, obviously. So one of the images of that today is the way that the anti-fascists are depicted in the United States as being those unlawful individuals that are opposing the system as though it stops there, right? As though we're not supposed to ask, you know, well, what is it they're fighting for? Is fascism emerging? Has it already emerged? Is it something that these people are doing an excellent job at, you know, um, kind of holding back? So it's in that way that the narrative around what is considered lawful or unlawful is dictated and mandated by those people in power. So what is more, these actions appear to be anti-democratic because the way in which we conduct ourselves democratically is, for Marcuse, purely a pseudo-democracy because, you know, it's a democracy determined by, you know, corporate interests, oil companies, pharmaceutical companies, and so on. So he says, we can't really say we're in a democracy. So, of course, any kind of real attempt at democracy is going to appear, going to appear undemocratic because we have internalized the image of the pseudo-democracy and made that real. So this revolutionary spirit is to challenge democracy as it manifests itself in favor to promote a rational democracy. So kind of keeping its good parts but getting rid of its bad parts. But what this will ultimately entail then is the revolutionaries to adopt their own language 
because the language has been determined far in advance by those wielders of power. And this harkens back to one of Nietzsche's uh, ideas in the genealogy of morality, that language is not, you know, some kind of neutral thing. It is mobilized to create or to essentially justify the pretty bad things. So who is considered good or bad or good or evil has its place within the con- construction of language itself. So in order for the system or the revolutionary spirit to be effective, they must take on a new kind of new linguistic parameters, new linguistic possibilities that stands outside of the current socioeconomic paradigm. So then that throws us here into the last section, last chapter, titled Solidarity, which is much of the same, but I tr- I'm trying not to be repetitive here. Uh, so he says, to repeat, <laughs> the possibility for resistance and for a kind of new possibility is surreal. That That is because it extends so far afield from what we know to be real or what we know to be possible. However, there are these pockets of resistance, of which Fidel Castro and, and Che Guevara, he says, are two examples, uh, not to mention the Viet Cong and, and uh, revolutions in, in uh, other Asian countries that show us that there is revolution is possible. So this reveals that how, however surreal the system is or however surreal the situation we find ourselves is, there is still a kind of tangible political project to be done. And what this ultimately comes down to is solidarity, right? Or as, you know, to add the caveat, it's a kind of solidarity of difference. So recognizing that this isn't going to be conducted under a kind of broad single narrative, but will rather be something very fluid and dynamic. So we must, though, make a distinction between what he calls, you know, good and bad solidarity. So people existing in solidarity in favor of fascism uh, is not a good thing. And then those people in favor of solidarity to welcome difference and possibility in favor of this kind of new sensibility is for him a good thing. And ultimately, or then he lays out essentially what the system will then prioritize right towards the end here, where he writes that... um, Production would be redirected in defiance of all the rationality of the performance principle. Socially necessary labor would be diverted to the construction of an aesthetic rather than repressive environment, to parks and gardens rather than highways and parking lots, to the creation of areas of withdrawal rather than massive fun and relaxation. Such redistribution of socially necessary labor, incompatible with any society governed by the profit and performance principle, would gradually alter society in all its dimensions. It would mean the ascent of the aesthetic aesthetic principle as form of the reality principle, a culture of receptivity based on the achievements of industrial civilization and initiating the end of its self-propelling productivity. Uh, so that's I guess that's essentially it. But he ends the, the book in a or the essay in a very good way. I think. I really like how he ends it here. So he asks, uh, and there is an ant, sorry, the social expression of the liberated work instinct is cooperation, fair enough, which, grounded in solidarity, directs the organization of the realm of necessity and the development of the realm of freedom. And there is an answer to the question which troubles the minds of so many men of goodwill. What are the people in a free society going to do? The answer which, I believe, strikes at the heart of the matter was given by a young black girl. She said, for the first time in our life, we shall be free to think about what we are going to do. Which I think is a very good way to end it, because, you know, he maintains the impossibility of sketching that system. And only essentially describing it as being a system of possibility. A system that won't be determined in advance by forces of domination and aggression, and that will open the door for the ability to talk about it, for the ability to even discuss what it is we find ourselves in and what the future might look like. So yeah, I guess that's pretty well it. Um, I think I covered, you know, the bulk of it. Obviously go and read it. And if you have 
you know, problems with what I did here. If you disagree, I think I 